Real Stories Tapes True Crime is your new true crime podcast fix. In our first season, we'll explore suspicious deaths at a California hospital and a skydiver landing dead on a suburban driveway with a bag containing guns, drugs, and night vision goggles. To join our investigation, search and subscribe to Real Stories Tapes True Crime on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. The events in this program are based on a true story. Names, dates, and details have been changed. When a man chasing the American dream accidentally commits a murder, he tries to escape his past by changing his identity again and again and again. Heidelberg, Germany, 2004. Richmond Gruber, a smart, handsome, and ambitious young man, grows up poor, but his days are rich with American television. On his 24th birthday, he packs his bags and flies to the United States to pursue the American dream. Cox's Creek, Kentucky. Gruber's tourist visa allows him to stay in the country for just two months, but he wants to stay for good. He meets a local student, Virginia Potts, at the campus library. She's attractive, but looks lonely. Gruber introduces himself. I'm Richard, by the way. One month and 29 days later, they marry. I do. Richmond borrows money from Virginia and enrolls as a freshman at the college. Richmond, a finance major, and Virginia, a biology major, are volunteers for a nonprofit organization to protect the endangered American wolf. Richmond is the campus treasurer. But all is not as it seems. Mr. Gruber, I need to talk to you. While working in the library, Richmond is approached by the group's campus president, Don Spicer. Don tells Richmond that withdrawals of over $10,000 have been made from the group's account and are not backed up by expenses. It's $10,000 missing from your account, and we need to find out why. Don accuses Richmond of stealing the money. Richmond denies the allegations, and the conversation turns into an argument, fed up. Don resolves to let the police decide Richmond's fate. But Richmond decides he can't allow this to happen. Wait, 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 Spicer, wait, wait. Richmond grabs his money box and smashes it over Don's head, cracking his skull. Richmond is shocked by his actions, but soon realizes that he's dead. Talk about your bad turn of events. This was a robbery that kind of turned into a murder, and once you've committed murder, there's no going back. Richmond wonders if he can hide what he's done. He props up Don's body at a library desk and surrounds him with books. To any passers-by, it would appear that Don fell asleep studying. This is interesting. Richmond isn't trying to hide the body. He's just trying to buy himself some time. He's got some time. He then returns to his room, cleans up the evidence, packs his bags, and leaves town. On his way out of the dorm, he sends a text message to his wife and then throws away his phone. With the money he stole, he pays cash for a bus ticket west. While Richmond is technically a fugitive, he's given authorities no reason to suspect him of anything. He just looks like a bum who's left his wife, and he's left no evidence. Richmond, who spent thousands of hours watching American TV in the 90s, has arrived at the center of the entertainment industry. Hi, I'm Rich Roberts. 
He loses his German accent and begins introducing himself as Rich Roberts, an ex-Harvard law student who dropped out to pursue screenwriting. Rich applies for an entry-level job in the mailroom of a talent agency. A lot of people, when they're trying to keep their identity a secret, move to a totally different kind of place. That's what Rich Roberts did. But he has to play by the rules. He still needs papers. What he does is he finds the name of a deceased child, a child who was born about the same time he was. Then he gets a copy of the birth certificate, and he uses that to get a new social security number. Rich even gets a driver's license so that when the talent agency runs a background on him, not only do all of his papers come up, but he comes up squeaky clean. The mailroom job pays barely above minimum wage, and Rich is quickly burning through the money he stole. Hi. Eyeing a way out, at a work event, he meets a divorced 51-year-old veteran screenwriter, Denise Hawkins, and charms his way into her bed. Within a week, Rich moves out of a hostel and into Denise's beautiful Beverly Hills home. Yeah, I was in Harvard Law. I did he tells her all about his law school days and his childhood in rural Pennsylvania including being pen pals with Francis Ford Coppola. It's so awesome. It's all a lie, of course, but he's really good at telling lies. All of these guys are, and they have no moral problem with doing it. It's just part of doing business. I know. He's so, so fun. I'm so happy he's here. Denise tells everyone that the talented young artist is simply renting a room at her house. But her own son, John, suspects otherwise. John, a military intelligence officer in the Marines, has just arrived home for two weeks' leave, and he's not a fan of his mother's new house guest. Um, John. John Rich. Rich. He senses something flimsy about Rich's charming stories. John's a sharp guy. In the service, you meet a lot of people, you see a lot of things, and your BS detector is at high gain. His first night home, when John hears Rich sneak into his mother's bedroom, he becomes determined to stop the affair. The next day, John sneaks into Rich's rented room and opens the Harvard dropout's bags. He rifles through Rich's belongings and takes his tourist visa. He finds a journal with handwriting in German on some pages. John drops the notebook on top of the bag and leaves armed with information to confront this so-called Rich Roberts. John isn't afraid of any confrontation, which is why when Rich returns to his room, he finds his bag unzipped and his notebook open. John is having breakfast when Rich walks in and says hello to him in German. Guten Morgen. John does a double take. This is not what he expected. Probably didn't expect to have bratwurst for breakfast either. Rich nonchalantly tells John that he studied abroad in Germany and fell in love with the language. But when John pulls out Rich's original German tourist visa, Rich stops smiling. How do you explain this? Um. John tells Rich to leave immediately. You need to get out of this house. Richmond Gruber, an aspiring German immigrant, tries to achieve the American dream, but a school administrator, Don Spicer, discovers that Richmond has been stealing money from the organization. Richmond accidentally kills Don and leaves for Los Angeles. He poses as Rich Roberts and charms his way into the life of an alcoholic divorcee, Denise Hawkins. But Denise's son discovers some conflicting information Sorry, we got off on the wrong foot, okay? Yeah, me too. Rich invites John to the backyard to try and smooth things out by talking guns and drinking beer. John seems hesitant, but likes guns and beer too much. Rich drops a sleeping drug in his drink, and John passes out on the spot. 
In Denise's basement, Rich pulls out a chainsaw and does his best Leatherface impression. John, passed out from the Rohypnol in his drink, is asleep on the floor. Rich takes him apart. He'd already killed once, so he was willing to kill again. But in order to keep the ruse going, he had to eliminate evidence. What the genius didn't know is that when you use a chainsaw, you splatter blood and flesh on the floor, the walls, even the ceiling. While trying to eliminate evidence, he multiplied it a thousand times. After Rich has murdered John, he works at a furious pace to thoroughly clean up the basement and bury John's mutilated body in the backyard. Denise staggers home that night, and Rich is already in bed as if nothing has happened. Denise wakes him, and he gets up. <laughs> The next morning, Rich is making breakfast for a hungover Denise. You all right? Yeah, I'm good. She okay. wonders where her son John is. Rich informs her that after going out last night, John received a top secret directive from the Marines and had to leave right away. And it was hard to see him depart. Almost a year has passed, and John Hawkins has not returned to his mother, Denise, like Rich told her he would. Rich has one more loose end to tie up. First, he quits his job and doesn't answer any more calls, texts, or emails. He plans to poison Denise by tainting her drink. Denise is at home, drinking alone, as usual. At this point, she has no idea what drink she's on. She starts to feel a little queasy and heads to the bathroom to throw up. She mistakenly slips and hits her head on the hard porcelain rim and passes away. Rich walks up to the house with a bottle of wine and the Rohypnol. He smells something nasty in the air. He walks in and sees something he never expected. Denise is dead. Rich suddenly realizes his job is done here and slowly walks away. Rich realizes Denise drinking herself to death has wrapped up a few loose ends, but he has to push the reset button now because there's another dead body in his life, which means a new name, a new location, a new job, and more. Rich decides to take off in John's new car. He needs cash fast, and one way to do that is sell John's vehicle. Rich posts an ad to sell the car on some online classifieds, but decides he has only one option at this point, and that's to ditch the ride and leave. Ditching the car is really the smartest and the only thing Rich can do, because a lot of people don't realize cars have their own fingerprints. It's called the vehicle identification number. And as soon as you enter that into computer databases, it tells you everything from the day it was built to the last owner. Rich knows it's time to shift gears and start the next chapter in his life. Meanwhile, a reality TV house flipping show is filming a renovation of Denise Hawkins' home, except they don't say that the previous owner died there. The owner decides that he wants to install a brand new pool. During the renovation, he discovers the remains of a mutilated body. The authorities are not able to make an ID, but we know they're the remains of John Hawkins. So now, Denise and her son, John, are the two roads that will take us to the true identity of Rich Roberts. But they're both dead. So we're left with no leads, no evidence, nothing that will tell us that Rich Roberts killed John and Denise. The murderer shapeshifter formerly known as Richmond Gruber then Rich Roberts has now taken the identity of a high roller professional poker player, Richard Regal. I call. His charm and attitude makes him appear as if he is perhaps from royalty and playing on an unlimited amount of funds. Meanwhile, John Hawkins' abandoned car is found in the outskirts of Las Vegas. 
Authorities determine then that Rich Roberts is a person of interest in his disappearance. An all points bulletin for Rich Roberts goes out to the Las Vegas police and all the regional authorities. German immigrant Richmond Gruber is accused of stealing money and kills the accuser. He escapes to Los Angeles, changes his name to Rich Roberts, charms a wealthy alcoholic widow, and then kills her son, John. Rich then heads to Las Vegas for a new role as Richard Regal, but the law's catching on to his game. Investigators find Richard's address and are surprised to discover that such a popular high roller actually lives on the outskirts of town. They break in, but he's gone without a trace. One month later, Rich Regal has relocated and is now masquerading as Rick Kennedy. He claims to be a distant relative of the famed Kennedy clan. Rick meets and quickly proposes to a real estate mogul, Kelly Davis. Rick is now on his fourth identity, fourth. And here's the problem. You've got Joe Schmo turning to John Doe. Well, Joe Schmo doesn't have fingerprints on file, neither does John Doe. Ultimately, you have to find the original person. Rick convinces Kelly to elope. He doesn't provide Kelly with much detail besides that most of his relatives have died or are too busy to attend a wedding. Kelly is okay with that, but she asks that Rick at least have a best man, so her dog Oliver fulfills the duty. Come on, if you're getting married, that's something you gotta look into. But maybe Kelly was afraid of what she'd find out. Kelly asks Rick to join her real estate empire. He does surprisingly well, and the empire grows. He also seems to enjoy his new life of luxury and hobnobbing with the Phoenix elite. Kelly gives birth to a son, Ricky. It is the first child for both. Kelly is unwittingly living with a man who has murdered two people in cold blood, and now all he has to do is stay Rick Kennedy, and there's no reason for authorities to suspect him of anything. Phoenix, Arizona, 2009. Rick leads a great life, making lots of money, but he doesn't know how to manage his good fortune and spends recklessly. Kelly hires a private investigator to look into Rick's life. The P.I.s uncover some troubling details about Rick. One, he is not related to the Kennedys. He has never been to Harvard. And finally, he misappropriates funds, manipulates earnings, and writes off false expenses at Kelly's real estate agency, putting her company at risk of being audited and shut down. Kelly needs to be very careful around Rick now, because while the PI has turned the information about Rick's shady dealings with her company, the PI hasn't turned the information about Rick being a serial killer. In a letter, Kelly has laid out the grounds for a divorce. She says she intends to get full custody of Ricky and has decided to relocate to London, England. She also says that if he fights custody, she will file criminal charges about his fraudulent financial records at the firm. This time, Rick has hit a new low, but it could have been worse. Kelly could have had him busted for a whole bunch of things, even though she didn't know the cold, hard truth about his past. And now Rick can't even fight for custody of his son, because when you do that, you're giving people permission to look into your background. And if you looked into Rick's background, what would you find? Murder. A year later, the divorce final, Rick faces a new harsh reality. He only gets to see his only son under court supervision three times a year. He spirals into a year-long depression. At this point, Rick is at his most vulnerable point. Sociopaths never care about anything, and they don't know what to do when they do. And Rick wants his son back. On a visit to Phoenix, Rick is ecstatic to see his son, even though a court supervisor is present. 
The two spend the afternoon playing sports and having a great time. Daddy, I love really spending time with you. But when Ricky Jr. is set to leave, Rick tells the court supervisor he needs to move something in the front seat. It's another ruse. Rick punches the supervisor and jumps into the driver's seat himself. When the supervisor comes around, he realizes Rick and Ricky are gone and immediately calls the police, who issue an Amber Alert. Rick Kennedy is a multiple identity shapeshifter who has assumed various personas over the years to protect the various murders and crimes he has committed. He has never been caught, but now is on the run. He's kidnapped his own son, Ricky, but it's only a matter of time before Rick and Ricky are found. Rick couldn't tie up this loose end, and this court supervisor was able to provide the car description, the license number, and most importantly, the identity of the kidnapper. Now the only thing police have to ask is, where are they going? Las Cruces, New Mexico. Rick doesn't get far. While getting gas, he is recognized immediately and arrested without incident. While Rick is in custody, investigators make some shocking discoveries. His fingerprints match that of a Richmond Gruber in Kentucky, tying him to the murder of a college administrator, Don Spicer. Police also match him as the missing suspect in the murder of John Hopkins over seven years ago. The authorities charge the shapeshifter, known as Rick Kennedy, for kidnapping and aggravated assault, Richard Regal for using a false name and information used for criminal intent, Rich Roberts for murder, and Richmond Gruber for murder. He is sentenced to life in prison. After years and years, the man originally known as Richmond Gruber is finally taken down for dozens and dozens and dozens of crimes. If it hadn't been for wanting to be with his son, he'd still be out there. Maybe not as rich, but he'd be free. Ironically, it was humanity that brought an inhuman shapeshifter to justice.